Chief Scientist at the Royal Institution of Australia. Alan, good to have you on the show. Um, we'll get to the significance of the mission in, in just a bit, but talk to us about uh, the lunar samples and what we hope to understand from them. The area that China uh, was able to successfully turn samples from is very different to the areas that have been previously explored back by the, the essentially the Apollo uh, era exploration of the US and, and the uh, versions of the Soviet Union. Those rocks they returned were much, much older. These rocks are, are perhaps only a billion years old and, and by astronomy standards, that is very recent indeed and can directly test ideas such as the formation of the moon and the late uh, time volcanism. Perhaps this could represent the last lava that ever flowed on the moon. So we're extremely excited to get these samples into the lab to understand what their chemical compositions are and really uh, add that final piece of the jigsaw puzzle to our closest neighbor. Um, I think it was the, um, the early 1970s since we last collected lunar samples. I mean, why did we stop? I mean, did the moon all of a sudden become boring uh, 40 years ago? It's, it's safe to say the moon has certainly become ever more exciting in recent years. It's, it is a demonstration of one's technological superiority. That is as true today as it was some 40 years ago. Uh, but also the awareness of the resources on the moon. That really has been a bit of a game changer. We've seen the water that can be used to support uh, astronauts through drinking or even uh, to split it into rocket fuel itself. So those kinds of resources are leading a return to the moon. And as part of that, missions like Chang'e are to demonstrate the technology to make possible human exploration and ultimately resource extraction from the moon. And that is a very different goal than uh, when Apollo went up there some 40, 50 years ago. I have just over a minute left on the show. Um, so talk to me about this excitement. We know that the U.S. also wants to return to the moon by 2024. Uh, we also know the country's sort of um, space force program. Um, as a scientist, uh, what do you think is, uh, talk to us about the next stage uh, is going to be looking like in terms of this space race? Sure thing. The, the next stage really is to continue to demonstrate one's technology. This is an automated mission, entirely robotic, itself an astounding achievement to rendezvous and, and, and dock the orbiters uh, all automatically. This is going to, of course, lead to a human presence uh, sometime in the mid to late 2020s for the US and uh, at the end of this decade for China. This is at least the intention. It's the change where commercial activities or commercial providers are also exploring this. We have the likes of, of Amazon's boss, Jeff Bezos, building his own uh, rocket to get to the moon. We have SpaceX, Elon Musk with similar ambitions, indeed even grander on to Mars and beyond. All of these activities will tell us more about the moon. We have to ensure that we use its resources responsibly. And that is a discussion that people of the world need to be participating in because that is a common heritage to us all. So we're very excited to see the, the Chang'e uh, progress. Hopefully the scientific insights we gain about our moon's formation will be uh, incredibly valuable and, and very much telling from just the few kilograms they've been able to return. But this is a dynamic space. This is the future for humanity's exploration. It will be to use the moon's resources. And we must do so responsibly. All right, the Royal Institution of Australia's lead scientist, Alan Duffy, thank you very much for joining us here on the program. <laughs>